Bill Cosby was once known to millions as America's Dad, but the comedian had his reputation shattered when he was sentenced to three to ten years in jail after being convicted of SUL assault. Born in 1937 in a social housing complex in Philadelphia, the young William Henry Cosby Jr. shone shoes and worked at a local supermarket to help his family make ends meet. His early life was touched by tragedy when one of his four brothers died and he, the oldest, became a father figure. Accounts of his school years portray him as a joker and storyteller who loved to entertain classmates. After school, he joined the U.S. Navy, then went to university and worked part-time as a bartender. Filling in for a club comedian, he laid the path for his future fame. His debut on NBC's Tonight Show in 1963 led to a recording contract with Warner Brothers and the release of a series of award-winning comedy albums. On one of those, 1968's To Russell My Brother, Whom I Slept With, he established the themes that would define his work. The father as a loving disciplinarian, siblings who could plot together one minute, then scream blue murder the next, and confidence in the bonds of family. The album sleeve notes, During his time on stage, Cosby never once told a joke. He didn't sing or dance or do tricks. All he did was talk. But the performer had the 10, 000, 000 strong audience in the palm of his hand throughout. By the time the album was released, Cosby was already a TV star. In 1965, he had become the first black actor to star in a drama series when he was cast in the espionage show I Spy. He played Alexander Scott, an undercover agent posing as a tennis instructor, alongside Robert Culp, who played fellow agent Kelly Robinson. Premiering during a time of great upheaval for race relations in the U.S., it was banned by some stations in the southern states. However, Cosby went on to earn three consecutive Best Actor Emmys for his role, a record that still stands. Despite his prominence on TV, the actor made a conscious decision not to directly address race relations in his act, preferring a more subtle challenge to the status quo. A white person listens to my act and he laughs and he thinks, yeah, that's the way I see it too, he once said. Okay, he's white, I'm Negro, and we both see things the same way. That must mean that we are alike, right? So I figure this way, I'm doing as much for good race relations as the next guy. The Cosby Show, launched by NBC in 1984 and aired for eight seasons, was his biggest success and established him as a household name. Based on his stand-up routines, Cosby's portrayal of an educated affluent doctor, Heathcliff Cliff Huxtable, and the trials of raising five young children drew parallels with his own life. His TV wife, Claire, was loosely based on his own wife, Camille, whom he married in 1964. The sitcom was watched by about 30 million viewers each week. By 1989, its star was earning $4 million monthly in syndication rights alone. When the show was canceled in 1992, Cosby embarked on a number of projects, including film roles, but was never able to emulate the success of his star vehicle. In 2013, he received rave reviews for his first TV stand-up show in 30 years, which led to a national tour. But his comeback fell apart as several women came forward with allegations of SUL assault going back almost 30 years. Bill Cosby's behavior with women allegedly goes all the way back to his early days as a stand-up comedian, according to his first accuser, Christina Rueli. In 2014, the then 71-year-old New Hampshireite opened up to Philadelphia Magazine about her time working at Cosby's Los Angeles talent agency in her early 20s. She explained the comedian approached her at work and invited her to a party. But when Ruley arrived, she was the only guest, and Cosby's wife was conveniently out of town. Ruley said she had only two drinks but somehow blacked out. He must have drugged me, she said. When she came to, she claimed, Cosby was naked and assaulting her, but she somehow wriggled free and was able to drive home. Two years later, Cosby allegedly made a move on the future wife of the Incredible Hulk himself, Lou Ferrigno. Carla Ferrigno was only 19, then single, working as a Playboy bunny in Los Angeles. Cosby invited Carla to the movies, awkwardly, alongside his wife, Camille. When Camille vanished, Carla claimed the cos made his move, and then kissed me so hard right in the mouth. No one has ever been that physically violent with me, she told the Daily Mail. I was stunned. I was frozen. 
I took all my body strength and used both of my arms to stop him and push him away from me. He was so forceful, she explained. Another victim, Andrea Constand, said Cosby gave her quaaludes, a type of sedative, and S. Yuley assaulted her decades ago. Constand filed a civil suit against Cosby years ago, and a damning deposition from that suit was made public in July 2015. In that deposition from 2005, Cosby answered yes to this question. When you got the quaaludes, was it in your mind that you were going to use these quaaludes for young women that you wanted to have S with? She went to police with the allegations, but a district attorney ruled that there wasn't enough evidence to charge Cosby. The district attorney on the case later told the Daily Mail that, at the time, he thought Cosby was probably guilty and wanted to arrest him. After police declined to charge Cosby, Constant filed a civil suit and lined up 13 other women as supporting witnesses who had stories about the actor similar to hers. The lawsuit was settled in 2006 for an undisclosed amount. Constant used to work for the women's basketball program at Temple University, Cosby's alma mater. She said she met Cosby in 2002 and saw him as a mentor. He invited her to dinners at his house, she told the Daily Mail. She said in court documents that in 2004, she went to Cosby's house for a visit at his request. He told her he wanted to help her pursue a new career, she said. When she talked about being stressed, he gave her three blue pills that he said were an herbal medication to help her relax, she said. Constan said she then began to feel shaky, weak, and dizzy. She said she told Cosby she wasn't feeling well, and he led her to a sofa where he laid her down. Constan said she was so impaired she couldn't walk on her own. She said Cosby then positioned himself behind her on the sofa and began touching her inappropriately. He then eschewally assaulted her while she was barely conscious, she said. Constan woke up around 4 a.m. with her clothes and underwear in disarray according to the lawsuit. Cosby greeted her in his bathrobe before she left his house, she said. After Constan filed the lawsuit that produced the deposition, she said she could produce more than a dozen other women with similar stories. But that suit was settled in 2006, and Cosby's reputation remained intact, until a few years ago. Then there is Tamara Green. Green, a lawyer who lives in California, was the only named supporting witness in Constance's suit. When Green heard that the district attorney thought Constance's story was weak and that she didn't come forward quickly enough, she decided to step forward and tell her story, she said. She said that Cosby assaulted her in the 1970s. Green told Newsweek she met the actor through a friend when she was 19 and modeling in Los Angeles. Green said she met Cosby for a business lunch one day while she had the flu and that he gave her pills he said were cold medicine. The lawyer told the Today Show in 2005 that she was face down on the table of a restaurant about 30 minutes after taking the pills. Cosby offered to take her home, she said. Once they were at Green's apartment, he undressed her and assaulted her in her bed, she said. Eventually, Green said, she started throwing things. Cosby left her apartment after leaving two $100 bills on her coffee table, according to the victim. She said in the Newsweek interview that she never reported the alleged assault to the police because, for a victim, it never works out unless you're bleeding and there's DNA and an eyewitness. I was 19 and he was the king of the world. Nobody would have believed me. Green told the news magazine that coming forward with the allegations essentially ended her career as a lawyer. The next victim was identified as Barbara Bowman. Bowman, another witness in Constance's lawsuit, came forward in 2006 in interviews with Philadelphia news outlets. She later wrote a column in the Washington Post in light of Burris's viral comedy video in which he called Cosby a rapist. Bowman said she met Cosby in 1985 when she was 17 years old and an aspiring actress. He became a father figure and mentor to her, she recalled. She said Cosby drugged and R her several times during the two years they knew each other. Bowman told the Daily Mail that he flew her all over the country and invited her to attend events with him to see if I was worth mentoring and grooming for an acting career. Bowman said in the Daily Mail interview that Cosby brainwashed her and befriended her mother to gain her trust. He eventually started giving her drugs and R-ing her, she alleged. 
She said she continued to see him because he was a helpful mentor while she was trying to build a career in the entertainment industry. Bowman said that one time, she had one glass of wine at Cosby's house, and then, a while later, she slumped over a toilet, throwing up while wearing a man's t-shirt. She told the Daily Mail that Cosby was wearing a robe as he was helping her after she regained consciousness. The last incident happened in Atlantic City, she said. She wrote in the post that she fought him when he tried to pin her to his bed, and he called her a baby and sent her home. Beth Ferrier is another victim of the doomed actor. According to Philadelphia Magazine, Ferrier met Cosby in 1984 while working as a young model in New York. She was another unnamed witness in Constan's lawsuit. She came forward with her story in the Philadelphia Daily News in 2005 after the suit was filed, but before it was settled. Her relationship with Cosby started as a consensual affair, she told the Daily News. She said in 2005 that the affair lasted about six months, but she told People magazine in 2006 that it was an on-and-off affair that lasted several years. Ferrier said that at one point after they decided to end the affair, Cosby drugged and assaulted her when she went to see him perform in Denver. Ferrier said Cosby gave her favorite coffee to relax her. After she drank it, she said, she started to feel woozy. She recalled waking up in the back seat of her car several hours later with her clothes disheveled. When she confronted him at his hotel later, he told her she had too much to drink, she said. Ferrier told People magazine in 2006 that she had recently lost her father when she met Cosby and was very vulnerable. Cosby was a mentor and father figure to her, she said. Then there is Joan Tarshis. In 2014, Hollywood Elsewhere published the accusations of Tarshis, a former actress who says Cosby are her in 1969. She decided to come forward after seeing renewed media attention on the Cosby allegations. Tarshis was 19 when she flew to Los Angeles to work on a monologue, and friends she was staying with knew Cosby, she said. She said she met the comedian at lunch, and he took a liking to her. Cosby asked Tarshis to work on some material with him one day, and he gave her a drink, she said. Tarshish says she vaguely remembers being undressed by Cosby and telling him that she had an infection so that he wouldn't have S with her. He still sexually assaulted her, she said. Tarshish told Hollywood Elsewhere about another incident she alleges occurred in a hotel room when he invited her to an event. She said she went because she was too ashamed to tell her mother what had happened and turned down the invitation. She never went to the police with the allegations. Tarshish told Philadelphia Magazine, what could I say? I was 19 years old. I felt, he's Bill Cosby. He'll lawyer himself up. I don't have a lawyer. It's going to be, he said, she said, and they'll look at me like I'm crazy. My reputation would have been ruined. Tarshis also said that at the time, no other women had come forward with similar accusations. And the list continues with Janis Jackson. Dickinson, a supermodel and TV personality, is so far the highest profile woman to publicly come forward and accuse Cosby of SU all assault. She told Entertainment Tonight in 2014 that Cosby assaulted her in 1982. Dickinson said she met the comic at the request of her agent, who was trying to get her booked on The Cosby Show. Dickinson later went to rehab for drug and alcohol abuse. She said Cosby called her while she was there, and then after she got out, he invited her to visit him while he was performing in Lake Tahoe. He told her he wanted to offer her a job and help her develop a singing career, she said. Dickinson said that after she had dinner with Cosby in Lake Tahoe, she had a glass of wine and a pill that Cosby gave her in her room. She says the last thing she remembers before passing out was seeing Cosby take off his patchwork robe and get on top of her. She told E.T. that she never went to the police because she was afraid of being labeled a whore or a slut and trying to sleep my way to the top of a career that never took place. Dickinson had alluded to her issues with Cosby, but hadn't publicly accused him of S.U.L. assault before 2014. She told E.T. that she wanted to write about her alleged assault in her 2002 autobiography, but was pressured by Cosby and his lawyers to remove the details of the incident. She said the alleged assault was one of the biggest resentments of her life. Therese Serenese is yet another victim of the hero-turned-villain actor. 
Serenese, a nurse in Florida, came forward in 2014 and identified herself as another of the 13 witnesses in Constan's suit. She said Cosby R. her four decades ago in Las Vegas. Serenese told the Huffington Post that she met Cosby in 1976 when she was 19. She said she was in Las Vegas visiting her mother and Cosby was in town to perform at the Hilton. She said she ran into him at the hotel's gift shop while she was there with her sister looking at jewelry. He came up to her, put his arm around her, and invited her to come see his show later, she said. Backstage after the show, Cosby gave Serenese two white pills, she said. She says the next thing she remembers is Cosby R. her in a bathroom. <laughs> she kept in touch with him intermittently throughout the next 20 years, she told the Huffington Post. There was one more SUL encounter in 1985, she said. Serenese also said Cosby put her up in a Hilton penthouse for three weeks after the alleged R in Las Vegas, and then sent her money in 1996 after she got into a car accident. She said she initially was reluctant to report the alleged assault because she thought no one would believe her. But she came forward after hearing about Constan's allegations. Then there is Beverly Johnson. In 2014, Beverly Johnson, the first black model to appear on the cover of Vogue, came forward to accuse Bill Cosby of drugging her. Writing in Vanity Fair, Johnson said Cosby drugged her in his home in the mid-1980s after she'd gone there to read lines for a part on The Cosby Show. She said the comedian gave her a cappuccino. I knew by the second sip of the drink Cosby had given me that I'd been drugged, and drugged good, she said. My head became woozy, my speech became slurred, and the room began to spin nonstop, she said she began shouting at Cosby. I recall his seething anger at my tirade and then him grabbing me by my left arm hard and yanking all 110 pounds of me down a bunch of stairs as my high heels clicked and clacked on every step, she said. I feared my neck was going to break with the force he was using to pull me down those stairs. She didn't say Cosby or her, but she accused him of physically assaulting her. Another Cosby victim is Chloe Goines. In 2015, a 24-year-old woman named Chloe Goines told the Los Angeles Police Department that Cosby had assaulted her at the Playboy Mansion when she was 18, according to CNN. While few details of her case have been revealed, it's notable because she alleges the assault took place in 2008. California has a 10-year statute of limitations on R cases, meaning the case could lead to criminal charges, according to her attorney, Spencer Coven. She was drugged, he told CNN. She doesn't know what happened. She blacked out and woke up finding Mr. Cosby over her as she was in a state of complete undress. Coven continued, I don't want to go into details about what he was doing, and I don't believe any of these cameras can actually publish what he was doing. Last but not least, there is Lily Bernard and Sammy Mays. In 2015, the celebrity lawyer Gloria Allred held a press conference to announce two more women were accusing Cosby of assaulting them. Sammy Mays, a writer, and Lily Bernard, who guest starred on The Cosby Show. Mays said Cosby drugged her in the late 80s when she was writing about a convention in New Orleans that Cosby attended, according to USA Today. She said she believes he are her while she was unconscious. On her part, Bernard says Cosby drugged R and threatened her in the Cosby Show studio in 1992. She said she still has panic attacks. I stand here to take back my power and to confront the fear that has paralyzed me for so many years, Bernard said during the press conference. While Bernard tried to bring criminal charges against Cosby in New Jersey, a prosecutor decided not to file any. Several other women also came forward. Angela Leslie, a former model and actress, said in a New York Daily News report published in November 2014 that Cosby assaulted her in a hotel room more than two decades ago. She said she met him in 1990 after she sent him a letter and photo, hoping to land a role in his movie, Ghost Dad. Cosby then invited her to the set of his show, she said. She said the alleged assault happened in a hotel suite in 1992 when the TV star asked her to audition for him. Leslie said he gave her a drink and told her to act like she was intoxicated. She didn't drink what Cosby gave her, but after she came out of the bathroom, Cosby was lying in bed with his clothes off, she said. Leslie said Cosby took her hand and forced her to fondle him while he was in bed. Another victim, Renita Cheney Hill of Pittsburgh, told KDKA News that she had a four-year relationship with Cosby in the 1980s. She says she believes he drugged and likely are her when she would go visit him. She was 15 when she met him. Hill told KDKA that Cosby would fly her to various cities, 
and she would visit him in his hotel room at night. He would insist that she drink, even though he knew she was underage, she said. Hill said she would wake up the next day and not remember anything despite not having that much to drink. She said that during one incident, right before she passed out, she remembered him kissing and touching her. Then there is Linda Traits, who met Cosby in 1969 when she was waiting tables at a restaurant he owned in West Hollywood, accused the actor of SUL assault in an interview with the Washington Post. She said Cosby chatted her up one day at the restaurant and offered her a ride home. But instead of going home, the TV star drove to the beach and took out a briefcase that had assorted sections in it, with pills and tablets in it, different colors arranged and assorted into compartments, she told the Post. She said she told Cosby that she didn't want any of the pills, but that he kept insisting. He then lunged at her and grabbed her chest, she said. When she ran out of the car and onto the beach, he pursued her and offered to take her home, she said. Victoria Valentino, a former Playboy bunny, told The Post she met Cosby in 1970 and became his victim. Another Playboy bunny knew Cosby and introduced him to Valentino, who met him for dinner with a friend one night after their initial meeting, she recalled. Cosby offered Valentino and her friend red pills at the end of dinner, she said. She said she then began slurring her words and couldn't function. Cosby then drove the pair to an apartment under the pretense of showing them memorabilia from his popular I Spy show. It was there that she said he assaulted her. She said she never went to the police because, in those days, it was always the R victim who wound up being victimized. Not done yet. Sean Brown, who Cosby has admitted to sleeping with, told the Daily Mail in November 2015 that he also drugged and R her. Judy Huth, another alleged victim, also filed a lawsuit in December 2014, accusing Cosby of Suali assaulting her at the Playboy Mansion when she was 15. Helen Gumpel, who appeared on one episode of The Cosby Show, came forward in 2015 and said Cosby made unwanted Suali advances toward her in 1977, according to the AP. Suni Wells and Margie Shapiro said in 2015 that Cosby S. Uali assaulted them in the 60s and 70s, when they were teenagers, according to Reuters. And finally, Autumn Burns, Marcella Tate, and Janice Baker Kinney, who are all represented by Allred, said in 2015 that Cosby are them in the 70s and early 80s. All this time, and for many years, I felt this was my fault, Kinney told USA Today. I took the pills from him. I never thought of it as R. I still felt like I was solely to blame. Clearly, there is absolutely no chance that all these unrelated women are lying. In 2014, comedian Hannibal Buress suggested Cosby was a hypocrite for telling African Americans how to behave. Sarcastically imitating Cosby, Buress said, Pull your pants up, black people. I was on TV in the 80s. I can talk down to you because I had a successful sitcom. Well, yeah, you're a rapist. Buress said to the audience. The taped set went viral, spurring more women to come forward. The renewed attention ultimately led the Associated Press to compel the release of the court deposition from 2005. Cosby has maintained his innocence even as more and more women have come forward to accuse him of R. The accusations have common threads, painting a picture of a man who used his power and influence in the entertainment industry to seek out vulnerable young women and lure them in with the promise of mentorship. Some have said they felt discouraged from going public because of Cosby's fame, power, and reputation as America's dad. Even before the actor was criminally charged, the accusations hurt his career. Cosby's agency, Creative Artists Agency, quietly dumped him in 2015, marking the start of his dramatic fall from grace. TV networks yanked reruns of The Cosby Show, and Disney took down a statue of the comedian at Hollywood Studios. In 2015, Inside Higher Ed reported that a dozen colleges had revoked his honorary degree. Ironically, there was a time when Cosby's daughter accused legendary boxer Mike Tyson of R. Cosby has aggressively defended himself against SUL assault allegations, suing some of his accusers and seeking to damage their credibility as a criminal SUL assault trial loomed in Pennsylvania. But when his own daughter, then 23, was the one making the accusations, he took a decidedly less confrontational approach and, in the process, gave a hint of his attitudes toward SUL misdeeds and their consequences. No criminal charges were sought against Tyson, who would later be convicted of R, another woman. Instead, 
Bill Cosby insisted through his attorneys that Tyson seek counseling. It was an approach that would strain an already troubled relationship with his daughter, according to her former attorney. He played more of a conciliatory role. She thought he should have handled it more like a father-daughter than like a politician or celebrity, said Louis J. Terminello, who was Aaron Cosby's attorney when the allegations became public in an interview. I don't think he quite looked at it that way. Tyson, who denied Aaron Cosby's allegations, steered clear of discussing the allegations. The Tyson melodrama traces back to 1989, but Aaron Cosby would not speak about it publicly until three years later, when she said an ex-boyfriend was threatening to leak the story to the tabloids. Aaron Cosby, who did not respond to emails or a voice message seeking to verify the story, outlined the accusations in detail in interviews with The Washington Post in 1992 and several other media outlets, including Phil Donahue's popular daytime show. In those interviews, she said she and a friend met the boxing champion and another man at a Manhattan nightclub in November 1989. They decided to leave the club together to find a place to talk. Aaron recounted that they piled into Tyson's car and headed out without a particular destination. When the car turned toward New Jersey, Aaron asked where they were going. Tyson, whose marriage to actress Robin Givens had ended amid allegations of spousal abuse the year before, told Aaron that they were going to a party at his estate. On the way, Aaron claimed, Tyson kept returning to the same theme, Bill Cosby. He was very concerned about how my father felt about him, Aaron later told a live studio audience on The Donahue Show. And I said, you know, everything is fine. My dad supports your fights. And he was very happy about that. In the car that night, Aaron became a bridge between two of the most recognizable men on earth. Cosby was at the height of his fame as the star of The Cosby Show and was pulling in $4 million a month in syndication revenue, according to a Forbes estimate. Tyson was the heavyweight champion of the world, a ferocious brawler who'd earned tens of millions of dollars after becoming the youngest heavyweight title holder in history. When Tyson, also 23 at the time, and Aaron arrived at his home, she said she saw cars out front and assumed a crowd was gathering for the party. But inside, the house was nearly empty. The scenario was not unlike the scenes recounted decades later by a woman who accused her father of inviting them to parties at his home, only to arrive to find almost no one there. On that night in New Jersey, Aaron says, Tyson gave her a tour. When they got to the trophy room, she told interviewers, the boxer locked the door. Then he was all over her, she alleged, pinning her to the floor and groping her until a member of the household staff heard her screams and knocked on the door, giving her an opportunity to flee. When Aaron told her father, the comedian's attorneys got in touch with Tyson's representatives and insisted that he attend psychiatric counseling, she said on Donahue. A recent Bill Cosby biography says the comedian also insisted that his daughter, who had developed a cocaine habit, attend therapy sessions. Erin has given a slightly different account, saying that she had decided to enter drug treatment on her own. As you would expect, Erin wasn't happy with her father's somewhat clinical response to her story. During her Donahue appearance, she was asked why she didn't question her father's management of the crisis. Well, because at that time, you know, with my own emotions and everything, I really felt that he would handle it, she told the audience. Two weeks after the alleged incident, she said, she ran into Tyson at the same nightclub where they'd met on the night of the alleged assault. She says he screamed at her, How dare you tell your parents? I have to go to therapy for a year. I was scared, Aaron recalled in the post-interview. In his autobiography, Undisputed Truth, Tyson does not mention Aaron or the purported demand that he seek counseling. But he does say that at the urging of boxing promoter Don King, he attended a therapy session with psychiatrist Alvin Poussin, a friend and co-author of Bill Cosby's, whom Tyson described as Bill Cosby's guy. Poussin asked me what my problem was and I started saying crazy things to him. He ran out of the house and never came back. The Tyson S. Ewell assault allegations were initially kept out of the media, but the tensions in the Cosby family were about to get a huge public airing. The month after his daughter says she was Yuli assaulted, Cosby made blistering remarks about her in an extended interview with the Los Angeles Times. 
The article doesn't mention the SUL assault allegation, but it does call into question Erin Cosby's character and maturity, with the father labeling her as very selfish. She's not a person you can trust, Cosby said. Right now, we're estranged. She can't come here. You think you're not a good parent because you don't answer the call, but you can't let the kid use you. The same year that Cosby was navigating his daughter's SUL assault allegations, several women say he was engaged in inappropriate SUL contact with them. An aspiring teenage model and actress, Jennifer Kaya Thompson, says she went to New York that year to confront him about an alleged SUL assault the previous year. Cosby has acknowledged SUL contact with Thompson, but has said it was consensual. Another woman, Lise Lott Lublin, alleged that she blacked out after Cosby drugged her drink that year in a Las Vegas hotel suite, and an actress named Eden Turrell has said the comedian S. Uoli harassed her by propositioning her while she was appearing on his television show. Erin says she went public after learning in 1992 that a former boyfriend was trying to sell the story of her S. Uoli assault allegations against Tyson to the tabloids. She responded by producing a videotape outlining her allegations in hopes that its existence would lessen the value of any story that her ex-boyfriend was peddling. She was really bothered by the fact that somebody tried to take advantage of her celebrity status, said Terminello, her former attorney. She agreed to appear on several television programs, including The Donahue Show. News of her scheduled appearance and the basic outline of her allegations appeared in mainstream media reports in April 1992, the same week her father's long run as a television father figure came to an end with the airing of the final episode of The Cosby Show. By then, a lot had changed. On this other side, Tyson had suffered a thudding fall. In 1990, he lost his heavyweight title. He'd been ordered to pay a small sum, $1.00, to a woman who sued him after accusing him of groping her at a nightclub. Then, in March 1992, he was sentenced in an Indiana courtroom to six years in prison for R. Desiree Washington, an 18-year-old former Miss Rhode Island. After the sentencing, Cosby, who had struck a conciliatory stance when his daughter accused Tyson of SUL assault, once again spoke in measured tones about the now notorious pugilist. It would be very honorable for the state of Indiana to allow this prisoner to be rehabilitated while he is serving his debt to society, Cosby told the Associated Press. His daughter's appearance on The Donahue Show was preempted for several weeks by coverage of the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles. By the time it aired, her truthfulness was already being questioned in a manner that in some ways echoes how her father would attempt to deflect SUL assault allegations almost three decades later. Erin Cosby's three-year-old allegations are demonstrably false. Alan Dershowitz, Tyson's attorney, told The Post for an article that ran several days before Erin Cosby's television appearance aired. We are reliably informed that Mike Tyson and Aaron Cosby were never alone in the same room together, and there are numerous witnesses who would testify. On the Donahue stage, Aaron found a receptive audience, but not one without doubts similar to those being tossed at her father's accusers now. They wanted to know whether she was drunk that night, she said she wasn't, and whether she was interested in Tyson prior to the alleged assault, which, again, she said she wasn't. But mostly, they wanted to know why she waited to say anything. If you're not doing this for publicity, why did you wait so long? Or did I miss something? One woman in the audience asked with a somewhat contemptuous glance. I think you missed something, Aaron said. I don't need the publicity. Another woman asked, why didn't you choose to press charges? Aaron said, at that time, you know, I was young and I was scared. Do you think if you'd have come out sooner... That what happened to Desiree Washington wouldn't have happened? Donahue asked. Yes, I do, she replied. An exclusive excerpt from a new biography details how Cosby went from near bankruptcy to beloved sitcom dad, his efforts to end his womanizing original ideas for Cliff Huxtable, and how he learned of his son Ennis's heartbreaking death. His life has been a bag of mixed fortunes, for sure. In the beginning, he product that Cosby had always dreamed of selling, was Jello. Growing up, he had watched the greatest comedians of their eras become spokesmen for the brand. 
Jack Benny in the 40s, Lucille Ball in the 50s, and Andy Griffith and Jim Neighbors in the 60s. Those are acts I want to follow, he told Norman Brokaw, his longtime agent at William Morris. Sales had slumped as women entered the workforce and no longer had the time to make the time-consuming original recipes. Now Jell-O's ad agency was plotting a new strategy, appeal to mothers through their children, and realized that Cosby could be just the celebrity to do that, given his popularity with young fans of Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids and the Electric Company. In 1974, it began rolling out the first of what would become dozens of Bill Cosby with Kids campaigns, in which Cosby made children giggle with delight at the thought of Jell-O treats, while announcers lectured their parents. If you have kids, you have to have pudding. As Cosby's renown as a pitchman grew, so did his reputation for clashing with the people who made advertising. As always, he preferred to ad-lib rather than recite ad copy word for word. Cosby was notoriously demanding about the kids in the Jell-O commercials. He thought they should reflect an array of races and ethnicities and would protest if he didn't get the rainbow he wanted. He had little time for the kind of spoiled behavior that was all too common among child models and their stage parents, and more than once, he had an offending brat thrown off the set. Cosby made no excuses for his impatience with the Madison Avenue culture. Deep down, he believed that he understood the products he was selling better than most of the executives who oversaw the accounts. Coca-Cola recruited the comedian for a huge ad campaign called Have a Coke and a Smile. He and Bob Hope were hired to record tags at the end of the new Coke commercials. Hope delivered him as written, while Cosby improvised and came up with something much better. I saw you, Cosby said, his face capturing a playful conspiracy. I saw you. You're smiling. When Black Enterprise magazine published a cover story on African-American pitchmen in 1981, Writer Stephen Gale reported that the deals earned Cosby more than $3 million a year. As Anthony Tortorici, Coke's chief of public relations, put it, the three most believable personalities are God, Walter Cronkite, and Bill Cosby. The actor began his 40s with the kind of financial security that had slipped through his fingers in his early 30s. After buying more than 200 acres surrounding his Massachusetts farm, he had purchased a brownstone in Manhattan and a home in Los Angeles Pacific Palisades. He referred to it as the house that Jell-O built. But he also was coming to grips with the frustrations of being a middle-aged man and father. In a comic essay for Ebony, Cosby even talked about how aging had affected his roving eye for women. One of the most important things when you turn 40 is that you weigh things thusly, he wrote. You look at the enjoyment you may get from a given activity, and then you look at the amount of work that may have to go into it. For example, S with a young, beautiful woman who has plenty of energy. In a picture that accompanied the story, Cosby stood on a diving board, smoking a cigar, looking over his shoulder wistfully at a bikini-clad, mocha-skinned beauty. One of those things you want but are glad you can't have, the caption read. But clearly, from the accusations that later resurfaced, he was lying. Cosby didn't tell Ebony readers about another step that he had taken to prove that he was serious about cutting back on his womanizing. He told one longtime girlfriend that he wanted to put an end to their relationship. And then he invited the woman and her mother, who had always disapproved of her daughter being involved with a married man, out to dinner. I'm very happy to be here, the mother told Cosby, because I always thought you had more sense than that. By 1983, the actor had spent enough time on the road perfecting his family man material that he was ready to record it. He decided to make a concert film, a medium that ironically had been made popular by Richard Pryor, a comic who had modeled himself after Cosby. Halfway through the film, Cosby segued into his new material on the trials of parenthood. My wife and I have five children, he announced, his eyes full of exasperation. And the reason why we have five children is because we do not want six. He described the constant squabbling between his kids and how they were always tattling on one another. Parents aren't interested in justice. They want quiet, he exclaimed, as the parents in the audience roared in recognition. Executives at 20th Century Fox thought it wasn't edgy enough, and they slated it for a limited art house release. 
Bill Cosby himself lasted in theaters for only a matter of weeks before it was relegated to home box office, the new cable movie channel. His downfall had begun. By the fall of 1983, he had found a new project in trying to help Sammy Davis Jr. make a comeback. Ever since they had met in the early 60s, Cosby had had a soft spot for Sammy. In the 70s, he had watched Sammy's hard living take its toll. His manager had dumped him, and he was all but broke. In 1980, Cosby suggested that they develop a show together. They tried it out at Harrah's and then at Caesar's Palace and found that they enjoyed each other's company and had on-stage chemistry. But Sammy struggled to hit notes and stopped trying to dance. After an early show one day, Cosby appeared in Sammy's dressing room. He pointed at his friend's distended belly. What the f*** is wrong with you? Cosby said. Davis took a sip of the vodka and coke on his dresser and fingered his paunch. Age, babe, he said. I'm not fighting it. Grow old gracefully, they say. Cosby secured a two-week run on Broadway. Yet even after weeks of promotion, the show was a bust. Every day that Cosby looked at the empty seats at the Gershwin, he grew more upset about his inability to deliver for Sammy, about his friend's sorry condition, but also about the thought that the years were slipping away for him too. His agent, Brokaw, was used to getting middle-of-the-night calls, and he could tell that Cosby was in a particularly somber and reflective state the night he called from New York in the middle of the run with Sammy Davis Jr. I think I'm ready to try another TV show, Cosby said. Marcy Carsey and Tom Werner were desperate. The two young programming executives had quit their jobs to form an independent production company. They were working in a one-room office above a shoe store and had taken out second mortgages on their homes to keep the company afloat. The two programmers had made their names at ABC in the late 70s, developing the comedies Taxi and Soap. But now it was 1984, and the conventional wisdom in Hollywood was that sitcoms were dead. Well, there's Bill Cosby, suggested Larry Auerbach, the head of the TV department at William Morris. Norman says he may be ready to do another TV show, but he wants a lot of money. When Auerbach told them how much, the producers swallowed hard. They would have to pay Cosby more than $1 million per season if the show succeeded. The producers had always said they were betting on themselves when they went independent, but that kind of money would mean betting on the company. Carsey and Werner went to Las Vegas to see Cosby perform and were reminded of everything they loved about him. But they also saw something new, and to them, even more exciting. As young parents, Carsey with two young children, Werner with three, they thought Cosby's new material on parenthood was extremely funny and remarkably true to life. What's missing on TV was a question they often asked themselves, and when it came to sitcoms in the early 80s, what was missing was the old father-knows-best sense that parents were in charge. From Silver Spoons to Webster, the family comedies of the day revolved around improbably precocious children manipulating hapless adults. Shortly after, Carsey and Werner were invited to dinner at Cosby's home in Pacific Palisades. Carsey made the argument for a show based on the strong point of view reflected in Cosby's comedy routines about the loving war between parents and their children. Flattered by the respect for his stand-up material, Cosby warmed to the idea. He thought it would be funny for the character to drive a limousine. It would allow him to tell stories about all the people and situations he encountered on the job and give him a flexible schedule so he could be at home during the day to interact with his children. Cosby proposed that the wife be a plumber or a carpenter, and she would be Latino and speak Spanish, so that when they had an argument, her husband wouldn't be able to understand what she was saying. Carsey heard two voices inside her head. Do whatever he wants! He's Bill Cosby, for God's sake! You need him, and you need this show! But another was saying, he's Bill Cosby. Even if he throws you out of this house, you need to tell him what you really think. The producers felt strongly that both parents on the show should be college graduates. As Cosby had proved in his stand-up act, the war of wits between parents and children was even funnier if the parents thought of themselves as highly intelligent people. Finally, shortly before 1 a.m., Cosby said the words that made Carsey think that she might be getting somewhere. I think my wife would agree with you. You will not be a chauffeur, Cosby's wife, Camille, said when he briefed her on the meeting. Why not? Cosby asked. 
because I'm not going to be a carpenter, Camille said. Camille rarely got so adamant about casual things. It was as if she was saying that he hadn't come this far, fighting for the dignity of characters on his previous shows, creating the role model of Fat Albert for kids, earning a doctorate in education. To fall back on the stereotypes conjured by a black chauffeur and a Latina handywoman. At one point, she told him that the limo driver idea was so crazy that he should see a psychiatrist and bring back a note. While his father was becoming the most popular TV star in America, Cosby's son, Ennis Cosby, was attending the George School, a boarding school in the hills of Bucks County, Pennsylvania. A gifted athlete like his father, he played almost every sport, football in the fall, basketball in the winter, and lacrosse and track and field in the spring. Cosby would often pay a surprise visit to cheer Ennis on and give his teammates so many pointers that they would joke that Mr. Cosby thought he was the coach. Still, Ennis's academic struggles persisted, and so did his father's frustration. Co-workers grew accustomed to walking by Cosby's dressing room and overhearing his distressed phone calls. You can do it, son, he would say. You just have to try harder. At the same time, the actor wasn't above making professional fun of his son's travails. When Ennis was 14, according to Cosby, he approached his father with a look that made Cosby suspect that he was going to ask for something. Dad, he said, I was talking to my friends, and they think that when I'm 16 and old enough to drive, I should have my own car. Fine, Cosby replied. You've got wonderful friends. I think it's terrific they want to buy you a car, the actor sarcastically answered. No, Dad, Ennis said. They want you to buy the car. What kind of car did you have in mind? Cosby asked. Gee, Dad, I think it would be really nice to have a Corvette, Ennis said. I'd like to buy you a Corvette, but not when you don't do your homework and you bring home D's on your report card. So I'll make you a deal. For the next two years, you make every effort to fulfill your potential in school, and even though Corvettes will then cost about $50,000, I'll buy you one. And I won't even care if you do bring home D's if your teachers tell me you tried as hard as you could, the actor advised his son. Ennis then grew very quiet. Dad, he said, what do you think about a Volkswagen? Cosby advised Ennis to apply to Morehouse, which had graduated generations of distinguished African Americans from Martin Luther King Jr. to Spike Lee. The TV star confided his own mixed feelings about having been one of few blacks at Temple University and how much he envied the bonds forged by his friends who had gone to historically black colleges. Ennis took his father's advice, but in his freshman year, he could manage no better than a 2.3 grade point average. In his sophomore year, one friend asked if he had been tested for dyslexia. When Ennis shared that possibility with his parents, they arranged for him to undergo a battery of tests. The diagnosis came back positive. That summer, he took classes designed to help dyslexics, and his grades began to improve. Cosby was so thrilled about Ennis's breakthrough that he decided to share it with his 30 million viewers. But he also wanted to blow the whistle on himself for having suggested for so long that the problem was a character flaw in Ennis, rather than a mental glitch, as the script called it. During his junior year, Ennis spent three days a week as a student teacher at an elementary school in one of Atlanta's blackest and poorest neighborhoods. After just two weeks, the teacher told him that she had noticed that the boys in the class, particularly the ones who didn't have fathers at home, performed better when he was around. By the time he graduated in the spring of 1992, he had made the dean's list and been accepted into his dream school, Columbia University's Teachers College. Then, as things were just turning up, tragedy struck the Cosby family. Can I speak to you in your dressing room? Producer Joanne Curley Kerner asked Cosby. There's been a killing in Los Angeles, she said as soon as the door was closed. Ennis may have been involved. He may be dead. Without saying anything, he put on his winter coat as if to say that he was ready to go now to get on his private jet and fly to his boy. But Curly Kerner told Cosby that the police wanted him to stay put. The chief spokesman for the LAPD, Commander Tim McBride, briefed Cosby. At roughly 1.30 a.m. L.A. time, a middle-aged woman had flagged down a police patrol car near the Mulholland Drive exit to the 405 freeway. 
She was frantic and said that she had a friend who had been shot. When she led the officers to a nearby access road called Skirball Center Drive, they found Ennis's dead body, a single bullet wound in his head. He was lying next to a green Mercedes convertible registered to Cosby Productions, and he had been changing a flat tire. The witness had seen someone, the police said, but she was badly shaken, in a terrible state. She couldn't describe the suspect clearly. She noted that Ennis, then 27, had called her on his car phone and asked her to come help him change the tire by shining the lights of her vehicle so that he could see in the darkness. As she sat in her Jaguar waiting for him to finish, a man tapped on her window and flashed a gun. Panicked, she drove off, but then she turned around and came back to see that Ennis had been shot and the suspect was fleeing on foot. Was it a robbery? Cosby asked. Robbery might have been a motive, the police said, but nothing appeared to be missing. Ennis still had a Rolex watch on his wrist and $3.20 bills in his pocket. The only object in his hand was a pack of American spirit cigarettes, as though he had been about to offer his killer a smoke. Those close to Cosby knew that he had a difficult time with death. When the jazz giant Dizzy Gillespie had fallen ill with pancreatic cancer a few years earlier, Cosby had called him every day, had gone to visit Dizzy in the hospital, had sat by his bedside and told him funny stories to try to keep his spirits up. But he hadn't gone to the funeral. I don't like to see people horizontally, he told friends at the time. But now he was going to have to bury Ennis, his only son, his prince. He was going to have to comfort Camille, who would be suffering a mother's grief, the pain of losing the baby she carried and raised to be a man. He would have to be there for Ennis's sisters, for the rest of his family, and for their dearest friends. As he drove into Manhattan, he knew that he couldn't escape the media thronging in front of his house. When the car pulled to the townhouse, Cosby climbed out, put his key in the front door, and then turned to face the reporters. He was my hero, he said quietly. The media circus made it obvious that there was only one place where Ennis could be buried in privacy. Cosby started making arrangements so his son could be laid to rest on the family property in Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts, in the fields where he had played as a child. That evening, Willie Williams, the Los Angeles chief of police, got through to Cosby, and they talked about other parents who had lost their children. They discussed Corey Williams, a 17-year-old black girl who had been shot that same day when she got caught in a gang battle as she was riding home from school in South Central L.A. Cosby asked for the number of Corey Williams' mother and later called her several times to offer comfort. Ennis's body arrived at home on Saturday. The burial took place the following day on one of those cold New England afternoons when the snow crunches underfoot. Besides three friends, there were only family members, Cosby and Camille and their four daughters, Cosby's brother Russell and his wife, Camille's mother and siblings and their spouses. There was no minister. As far as they were concerned, Ennis was already blessed. The mourners gathered in a renovated barn where the casket lay in state. Together, they carried it down a small hill to the herb garden. Then Cosby began to eulogize his son. We now want to give praise to God for allowing us to know Ennis, he began, his voice cracking. Not for giving him to us, but just for letting us know him. Now please, bow your heads and give praise to God. As heads began to lift, Cosby said, Now if you want to say something to Ennis, please say it. His daughter Ensa went first. She addressed the casket, but struggled to find the right words and kept breaking down crying. Ennis, I'm just sounding like myself, aren't I? She said, and everyone in the circle laughed. Next, Evan, the youngest, spoke up. She began telling a story, but then she interrupted herself. Yeah, but Ennis, I know that you know that I'm lying, she said, and everyone laughed again. As they went around the circle, everyone added a funny story or comment to Ennis, and the laughter continued. Finally, the circle came around to Cosby again. He talked about Ennis's great-great-grandfather, Zach Cosby, who had been born a slave but lived to be a proud, free farmer. He talked about Ennis's great-grandfather, Samuel Russell Cosby, who had brought the family to Philadelphia and become a factory worker. He pointed to a spot nearby. Also, Ennis, he said, we're going to put down a tree. Yes, Ennis, a pine tree, Camille chimed in. 
We're going to plant a pine tree and light it every Christmas and on your birthday. A 19-year-old Ukrainian immigrant named Mikhail Markasev was eventually caught and sentenced to life in prison for the crime, per the New York Times. Police suspected the killing was an impulsive robbery gone wrong. But when Ennis's body was found, he still had a Rolex on his wrist and $3.20 bills in his pocket, as mentioned earlier. Ennis's only fault was in being in the path of a wicked idiot like myself, Markasev wrote years later from prison, according to Radar. The senseless tragedy of his untimely death and the sacred sorrow experienced by his family is something that I hope you will never have to experience, and yet it happens daily in the world. That was the first moment Cosby really felt pain, and the entire world sympathized with him. But Ennis is not the only child Cosby has lost. One of the actor's fiercest defenders was one of his five children, daughter Esna. The yoga instructor went on the widely heard The Breakfast Club interview in 2017, just before her famous father would go on trial for R. The man portrayed in the media today is not who my father is, she declared, adding, the accusations against my father have been one-sided since the beginning. Approaching middle age, Esna began experiencing kidney issues and died suddenly in 2018 of renal failure. She would be buried in the Ennis Garden next to her murdered brother at Bill Cosby's Massachusetts compound, according to the Daily Mail. But she did not die before proclaiming her father's total innocence, claiming bigotry was to blame. I believe that racism has played a big role in all aspects of this scandal, she vented to the Breakfast Club. My father has been publicly lynched in the media, and my family, my young daughter, my young niece and nephew have had to stand helplessly by and watch the double standard, or pretending to protect the rights of some, but ignoring the rights of others and exposing innocent children to such appalling accusations about someone that they love dearly and who has been so loving and kind to them is beyond cruel. Esna went on to say that her father was being punished by a society that still believes black men are white women. The tragic deaths aside, one of the strangest episodes in Cosby's twisted life's tale is the time a woman named Autumn Jackson, his alleged love child, attempted to extort the comedian for millions. In 1997, at the peak of Cosby's fame, Jackson went on trial with two men involved in the plot and was convicted on federal charges of conspiracy to extract $40 million from the Hollywood star. But interestingly, she might actually be his daughter. Cosby admitted in the trial that he had S with Jackson's mother, a woman named Sean Thompson, according to the Irish Times. Autumn Jackson had concocted this scheme to expose the actor as a deadbeat dad, she wrote in one incriminating letter. However, the court found the issue of paternity irrelevant to the case. The crime was exertions, end of the story. Except it wasn't. Jackson served only 14 months of her 26-month sentence per the New York Times. A three-judge Second Circuit appeals panel ruled that the original judge had improperly instructed the jury and thus tossed out the conviction. However, in what the Times called a highly unusual move, that same panel then reversed its own decision, saying the jury instructions were a harmless error. Jackson's defense attorney, Robert M. Baum, claimed the extortionist genuinely believed herself to be Cosby's legitimate daughter. He said of the verdict, she was devastated. She just broke down and started crying and couldn't talk to me anymore. Years later, as the accusations piled up against the formerly beloved America's dad, it didn't take long for Bill Cosby to face at least some fractional consequences of his alleged decades of heinous S-crimes, mostly targeting aspiring Hollywood starlets. In 2017, only three years after the infamous Hannibal Buress stand-up set, Cosby stood trial for the assault of Andrea Constand, which occurred in his home in 2004, according to CNN. Initially, the jury was deadlocked and couldn't reach a verdict, according to the Los Angeles Times. Prosecutors vowed to retry the case, and in 2018, things were different. A jury of seven men and five women found Cosby guilty of assault with lack of consent, penetration while the victim was unconscious, and assault after impairing the victim with an intoxicant. When asked if these accusations had to do with race by Sirius XM host Michael Smirkanish, Cosby took the opportunity. 
I just truly believe that some of it may very well be that, he said via the Los Angeles Times. Nonetheless, the then 81-year-old entertainer was sentenced to three to ten years behind bars, which could have potentially accounted for the rest of his life. The senior citizen was also classified as a Suali violent predator, according to CNN. We're glad that Judgment Day has finally come for Mr. Cosby, Constan's attorney Gloria Allred said while decrying the fact that many other accusers were denied the right to testify. But the Cosby Show is where all the drama began. Without a shred of doubt, the Cosby Show was more than just a hit sitcom. It was a sitcom for the whole family, achingly so. Cliff Huxtable wasn't just a put-upon father of five or a deadpan granddad or an exasperated guardian. He was a sought-after obstetrician who brought even more kids into the show's fictional world. The scenes of him in his office, consulting with expectant families, and allaying the anxieties of pregnant moms make an important point. For all of Dr. Huxtable's hopelessness at home, he was actually really good at his job, grounding his character while making the adults in the audience feel seen, too. For over a decade, The Cosby Show was one of the most popular sitcoms for families across America. The program mixed family values, wealth, and humor all at once, giving NBC the advantage in the Nielsen ratings every Thursday night in the late 80s and early 90s. The Cosby Show's popularity, however, would not be obtained without some opposition from its critics. While the Huxtables represented what a typical family should be on the television screen, they did not represent the typical family in everyday life. One of the main disputes concerning The Cosby Show has to do with its racial implications. The Huxtables were an all-black family living in a prominent neighborhood just outside a major city. To add to the grandeur of the Huxtables, the father was a doctor, the mother was a successful lawyer, and the family would eventually see their children attend colleges such as Princeton and New York University. These accomplishments, unfortunately, did not mirror the reality of the typical African-American family. The contrast between The Cosby Show and reality brought forth many important questions, questions that challenged the legitimacy of the show on a societal level. With the American public carrying preconceived notions in regards to African-American lifestyles, television producers fed off of these feelings in order to make programming that involved black culture. The basic premise of The Cosby Show would be simple if not for the stereotypical environment surrounding the program. In addition to the historical prejudices that America was fighting to overcome, the media slowed efforts to eliminate discrimination and racism through the constant exploitation of racial stereotypes. With the American public still struggling with the effects of the civil rights movement, television became an outlet for people to experience other facets of life, including black culture. Despite the racial climate of the post-civil rights era, Many predominantly black sitcoms gained popularity. Shows such as Good Times and Sanford and Son earned solid reputations on television as their humorous cast members propelled broadcast ratings. Other black families would be portrayed between the 70s and 80s, but the inception of The Cosby Show introduced a black family unlike any other on television. The difference between The Cosby Show and its predecessors was that Bill Cosby made an effort to gain popularity by shying away from what society perceived as the typical black family. Good Times and Sanford and Son made their mark by reaffirming negative black stereotypes, including poverty and ignorance, and arguably creating new ones. When Bill Cosby altered the landscape of television stereotypes, he proved that breaking the norm, however risky, could be profitable. Cosby's gamble did pay off and would create an onslaught of black programming that continued to address the issues of stereotypes in America. We all know that Cosby wanted to make a successful family program, but was this his only goal? Did the comedian intend to create an affluent black family on television specifically to uplift black families watching The Cosby Show? Or did he intend for white viewers to relate to the show's all-black cast, thus reinforcing the humanity of black people in the eyes of its white viewers? So many questions with fewer or no answers. Throughout the history of television and media, many stereotypical images of African Americans have been etched into the minds of viewers. Most of these images are negative. Black television families were always working class, always used slang, and incorporated gratuitous amounts of slapstick, often described by critics as shucking and jiving. 
television media authenticated the African-American stereotype by highlighting only those African-Americans who committed crimes. Sitcoms mirrored the reality that television media depicted as being black culture. While the image of the black family living in poverty was an undeniable truth in American society, the consistently derogatory illustrations of black culture led to cases of stereotyping, where viewers believed the negative image presented to them on television because they were the only images available. However, with the advent of The Cosby Show, the black family and, in essence, black livelihood, was given a new image. Bill Cosby not only articulated the presence of a powerful black family in the Huxtables, he made Americans love them as well. With this being said, however, one important question remains. Did Cosby successfully break racial stereotypes through The Cosby Show? Was he able to prove to the masses that African Americans did not fit the mold that television and media broadcasted daily? The Cosby Show, which debuted in 1984, was initially a hit not because of controversy, but because it related well to all people and not just to specific groups. An all-black cast intrigued African American viewers, and the theme of an upper-class lifestyle allowed white viewers to tune in as well. Despite the discussion concerning race and class, the personalities of the characters on The Cosby Show would ultimately have the most influence on the success of the program. The sitcom presented individuals and relationships that families across America could relate to. Rudy, played by Keisha Knight Pulliam, was the youngest daughter on the show. At age four, Rudy was the cute child who always managed to get herself in trouble, whether it was tampering with something she shouldn't have been or upsetting her older siblings with her curiosity. Yet her innocence was adorable, and the family displayed the type of love and affection that would allow Rudy to grow up into a respectable young lady. Vanessa, played by Tempest Bledsoe, encompassed the typical 11-year-old girl as she endured issues such as puberty and relationships with boys in school. Denise, played by Lisa Bonet, illustrated the rebellious high school teenager. Wishing to explore everything that life had to offer, Denise would consistently test the authority of her parents, as most teenagers would during this time in their lives. The only male sibling in the family was Theo, played by Malcolm Jamal Warner. Theo, who was a little younger than Denise, reacted to situations the way any boy would in an all-girl environment. He was embarrassed when his sisters found out he had a girlfriend. He would forbid his sisters to enter his room, which often contained posters of female models, and he shared a special bond with his father, Cliff Huxtable, played by Bill Cosby, mainly because they were the only men of the household. While the children represented genuine family encounters, their parents thoroughly completed the realistic feel of The Cosby Show. Claire Huxtable, played by Felicia Rashad, would offer advice, guidance, and appropriate punishment for her four children at home. Cliff, however, was the father of all fathers on television. Not only did he relate well to his children, but he was able to do so in a very humorous fashion. Cliff was able to turn everyday occurrences like Theo's bad grades on a test into a comedic outburst while still being able to convey the proper message to his son. The family environment of The Cosby Show allowed people to ignore the fact that its characters were black, temporarily at least. The nature of this sitcom, however, proved to both help and hurt the overall feel of the show based on the reaction from many critics. Because the show depicted real family interaction without much mention of serious and life-altering subjects that affect many families, critics were compelled to question the genuineness of the show. Many critics dispute that the absence of black economic struggle in The Cosby Show is highly detrimental to the viewers who watch it, since people may look at the Huxtables as an ordinary family when, statistically, they are not. Very few black families in America hold the economic status of the Huxtables, yet their existence on television almost insisted that this type of occurrence was commonplace. Critics also felt that creating this false image of black social life suggested that all blacks, like the Huxtables, were happy in their community and inside their homes because they were never confronted with racially charged situations. The omission of these types of situations caused many critics to question the plausibility of the show, since the general sentiment was that an overwhelming majority of African Americans experienced some form of racism or prejudice as a result of the history of the United States.
The Cosby Show, in essence, created fictional realism. Fictional realism can be described as creating a realistic environment without incorporating realistic consequences. In the case of The Cosby Show, successful blacks immersed themselves in a legitimate environment, but the reactions from people outside of the Huxtable family were deemed as inauthentic. The behaviors, mannerisms, and lifestyle of the family were perceived as unreal. For example, Cliff Huxtable is never a victim of a racially specific crime such as racial profiling, for instance. However, many would contest that Cliff's race and wealthy surroundings make him a prime target. In the end, Cosby's reputation as a TV darling was swept under the rug and can now only be remembered as a prolific sexual predator. But in a twist of things, it has been revealed that Cosby isn't sorry for his heinous crimes. There are two times when you might want to express sincere remorse. One is facing a judge about to hand down your sentence, and the other, perhaps more allegorical, is somewhere near the pearly gates, where the sentencing guidelines can reach well into infinity. Shockingly, Bill Cosby has shown no interest in such repentance, in any venue, earthly or otherwise. In a 2019 interview from Behind Bars with Black Press USA, the legendary comic remained utterly defiant, still painting himself as the victim of a witch hunt. When I come up for parole, they're not going to hear me say that I have remorse. I was there. I don't care what group of people come along and talk about this when they weren't there. They don't know. He also called the justice system that put him behind bars a sham, claiming it's all a setup, that whole jury thing, they were imposters. Blaming the jury for pre-trial bias, Cosby went on to allege some kind of conspiracy. This is political, I can see the whole thing. Cosby also wanted the public to know he was not broken by the process. I am a privileged man in prison, he said, calling his cell my penthouse. In the wide-ranging interview, Cosby went on to decry drugs in black neighborhoods and the high incarceration rates of black men, urging, as he always has, personal responsibility a virtue he doesn't appear to apply to himself. Despite his defiance, the actor will likely never face charges stemming from the vast majority of his nearly 60 accusations of SUL assault. As previously mentioned, his first alleged victims go all the way back to the 1960s, where the statute of limitations has long since expired on criminal proceedings, though Cosby's case has moved legislators to change those laws in some states. But even his one conviction for R was thrown out in June 2021, per the AP. A ruling by the state's Supreme Court revealed that a previous prosecutor had promised not to charge Cosby based on his own statements given in a related civil case. The court said subsequent district attorneys, including the one who brought charges, were bound by this pledge, even though it was not put in writing. Cosby had served just three years of his 10-year sentence and at age 83, was once again a free man. His TV wife on The Cosby Show, actor Felicia Rashad, rejoiced in the news, tweeting, Finally, a terrible wrong is being righted. A miscarriage of justice is corrected. However, the SUL assault survivors advocacy group Times Up had a very different take, condemning the news with a statement via Variety's Elizabeth Wagmeister. The semblance of justice these women had in knowing Cosby was convicted has been completely erased with his release today. Meanwhile, Cosby tweeted in part, I have never changed my stance nor my story. I have always maintained my innocence. Thank you to all my fans, supporters, and friends who stood by me through this ordeal. So, can this be described as a miscarriage of justice for all those victims? Let us know in the comment section below. And that's it from us today. Until next time, thank you for watching.